This is The Saucer Life, a podcast in which we examine concepts, events, or people orbiting the world of flying saucers. Few preconceptions, snark when justified, no belief, no debunking. Today, we're going to be talking about a woman named Laura Mundo, whom we first encountered way back in 2017 in an episode about FBI interest in the Detroit Flying Saucer Club. Laura was part of the Detroit area flying saucer scene back in the 1950s and 60s, into the 70s and 80s before her death in 1989. And she was responsible for promoting lectures and talks by George Adamski, George Hunt Williamson, I think George Van Tassel, uh, and a number of other prominent contactees of the time, not all of them named George. Today, we're going to be looking at her 1963 book, Flying Saucers and the Father's Plan, which was published by Gray Barker's Saucerian Press. We go into Laura Mundo's background and activities in the 1950s in a bit of detail in our episode, And Then the Feds Showed Up, which is linked in the show notes. If you haven't listened to that very early Saucer Life episode, um, go ahead and do that. It's uh, it's a good one. It's probably one of my favorites that we've ever done. And uh, please forgive the fact that it is an early Saucer Life episode. So, Laura Mundo was born in 1913 in Boston, I believe, and eventually ended up in Detroit. She was involved in a number of community theater groups, and she was one of the principal characters on a very early children's television show in 1950, 51, 52, thereabouts in Detroit. Uh, It lasted a year, and I found this interesting just from a history of uh, television standpoint. I think it was called Play School, and it was very popular. And one of the networks, I think NBC, was looking for a good preschool-aged kids show to pick up. And there was another one in Chicago, a locally produced TV show for preschool-aged children. And that one ended up getting picked up by the network rather than the Detroit one. Um, Not because it was necessarily better, but because with network broadcasting facilities, it was easier to nationwide broadcast something that was produced in Detroit or in Chicago rather than Detroit, which is a little sad, I think. So that show ended after a year. Um, Laura got divorced in 1950 from her husband, Otto Markser. So she goes into the 50s as a a 37-year-old single mom with two teenage sons living in Dearborn, uh, which is in suburban Detroit. A friend gave her a copy of the, at that time, new in 1953 uh, book, Flying Saucers Have Landed by Desmond Leslie and George Adamski. And Laura was off to the races as far as interest in flying saucers goes. By the mid-1950s, she is involved in the local scene, printing up newsletters, starting organizations, bringing in basically every big contactee name you can think of to Detroit to lecture to large groups to talk to her club or organization, whichever it was at the time. It sort of shifts back and forth in her home. She is a pretty big name in a fairly small pond. Uh, That's a mixed, mixed sort of metaphor there. By the early 1960s, however, the contactee fad had faded a little bit and Laura is still very much in the contact mode and will be forever which brings us to the real focus for today her book Flying Saucers and the Father's Plan this is a thin volume it's under 80 pages it it's sort of eight and a half by 11 staple spiral bound thing as it was original originally printed there is a reprint out there on Amazon, which which I got, but I compared it to to some other sort of um, uh, photographs and, and things of the book, and it, it looks like it's a straight 
sort of reproduction rather than being retypeset and everything. So um, I'm f- about as certain as I can be that the the contents are, you know, faithful to what Laura um, published. Although what Laura published is not necessarily what Laura initially wrote, as we will hear near the end of the program today. So this book comes out in 1963, published by Gray Barker's Caesarian Press, as I noted. And it is dedicated to George Adamski. She says, this book is dedicated to George Adamski, who opened the way into outer space for me and to my co-workers, both from this planet and other planets, who would want no credit, and to the father of us all, on all planets, as Earthman once more joins the universal family of planets from which he has so long ignorantly isolated himself. So, there. That's a nice uh, nice introduction. Gives uh, Adamski credit for, um, not for his ideas, but for kind of opening the door. That's how she says. Opening the door, opening the way for other people to also be contactees. That's probably not how she intended it, but that's kind of the meaning, isn't it? What are we thanking Adamski for? Not for his message of love and universal peace, but for basically paving the way for a bunch of other of us to do this as, uh, if not as a living, as uh, some sort of uh, some sort of vocation. The subtitle of the book is "Reconciling Christianity with Science and Philosophy," which, which sounds like would something that would need more than eighty pages to uh, to accomplish. But you know, we should give it a we should give it a chance, right? There is an author's note, and um, she she makes it. Uh, this is interesting. This is she talks about the person who wrote. The preface, which is coming up next, and that's her friend Carmela Falzone, who's the co-director with Laura of the Planetary Center um, in Dearborn, who uh, is also the co-editor of the Interplanetary Newsletter, which is Laura's newsletter at that time. She she also includes a kind of warning or something. I'm not sure how to label or describe what this particular paragraph is. Because she suggested that any editing might possibly change meanings, if only subtly, the author has requested that the publisher refrain from correcting any part of Carmela's preface. I don't know. I thought that was worded kind of strangely. It's only the preface that could be altered by editing? I don't know. So she goes on to tell us about Carmela. Carmela's worked with her at the uh, at the at the um, at the center, while also working five or six days a week as a upholstery seamstress at the Fisher Body Division of General Motors in Livonia, um, she says it's from Carmela that Laura many times borrowed money on which to live personally, to be paid back as the father wills on a perpetuating long term, no due date and no interest charge loan. So she's introducing the person who is going to be introducing the book, which seems kind of odd to me. And one of the first things she says is, I've loaned this woman a lot of money over the years and I don't expect to get it back. I, I don't know. It's it's very strange. Carmela is single, age 35, from Italian parentage that could uh, neither read nor write and did not therefore emphasize education. Carmela did not finish grammar school. She honestly doesn't seem to be that complimentary about Carmela, except to say that because you know she she doesn't have an education, she she's not you know super sophisticated. Her parents and family were casual about their Catholicism, so she has no background in in metaphysics, and she's never seen a flying saucer. So so, what's Carmela got going for her here? She's she's got no money, she's got no education. Um, she works six days a week. It's 35, single, lives with her parents. Laura, why are you telling us all this? She's telling us all this in order to convey the idea that despite this being how Carmela is, um, Carmela understands the father's plan. Carmela understands what Laura's laying down here. And if Car- it's almost a sense that if Carmela can understand it, any of you dolts can. Um I, again, I don't think that's how Laura intends this to come across, but that's really kind of how it comes across to me. But um, Carmela's had some struggles because of her uh, interest in flying saucers. 
Carmela has continued to work with us despite family disapproval, such as the open antagonism of one brother who shares with her the responsibility of the home and care of an aging mother, who sometimes tried to understand, sometimes opposed. Of other married brothers and sisters, some opposed, some allowed. She went through a major surgical operation during this period as well. She did not follow the author blindly either. Often she was presented with difficult choices that meant calling upon the father. Despite these hardships, Carmela was happy to provide the preface. And in this preface, Carmela says, The contents of the book are for those who are realistic of mind, not for the gullible at large who follow blindly without question. So this is only for critical thinkers, realistic people. It's not for gullible suckers. Next paragraph. For the skeptic person who may read this book and draw upon an immediate conclusion that it's basically unsound due to the lack of tangible evidence. That's a sentence fragment. Sorry. Um, It is only because the author is unable to supply them with such proof to back up her understanding in which she is passing on free of charge. Look, it's not that she doesn't want to give you proof. It's that she is unable to give you proof. So we go from this book is for serious-minded thinkers, not gullible people, to skeptics may say this book isn't that great because there's a complete lack of tangible proof. But hey, she would give you the proof if she could. Not a great start if you're trying to uh, convince uh, serious, realistic people that what they're about to read is valuable. For our purposes here, as we sort of look at the the somewhat goofy reasoning of contactees, not just contactees, all UFO people um, at some point or other, it's actually pretty good for our purposes. Carmela then sort of segues into what we might consider a a standard bit of contactee social evaluation analysis and geopolitics. The atomic age has increased the anxiety within mankind with knowing the probability one day of facing annihilation by the atomic bomb. His hopes of lasting peace among men and nations diminishes as this age-old problem of rumors of war confront him daily as new crises develop on our planet. He accepts the former possibility without question, as being inevitable as a consequence. Needless to say, this trained line of thought could eventually lead Earthmen to his earthly destruction, as he maintains this sort of negative attitude. For the remainder of the preface, Carmela basically talks about how we need to heed the words of the visitors, we need to welcome them, and that... Laura has the right idea about what's going on with all of this. And it's interesting. This preface is honestly riddled with some pretty basic grammatical errors. And I don't know. I I know that Laura instructed Gray that, you know, that nothing should be touched in the preface because the meaning might be changed. But with her own emphasis on Carmela's lack of education – I kind of wonder if not correcting any grammar is a way to highlight that. I don't know. That makes no sense, but I don't know. It's it's contacty stuff, Aaron. None of it makes sense. Now we get into the bulk of the book itself with the table of contents revealing some interesting chapter titles. Chapter two is I See the Saucers, followed by A Winnowing Out, My Meeting with Orthon, I meet Satan. And then the last chapter, for advanced thinkers only. So I suppose I can probably skip that chapter. This first chapter is called The Father's Plan, and she's happy to pass on her experiences in connection with flying saucers and to reveal the understanding she's received from meeting the space people. And she says, what is The Father's Plan? In a nutshell, as the visitors have expressed it to me, well, this is what she learned. Christianity is taught, unaware that other religions have also done so, that we must be redeemed. It has not been able to quite tell us why or from what. It has not been able to tell us who we are. As Christians, we have considered ourselves as an organization of the elect, who, as an organization, are primarily concerned with unionizing ourselves against going to hell. I don't know. I think Christianity over the last couple millennia has been pretty clear 
about what humanity needed to be redeemed from and why. It all goes back to the notion of original sin and needing to be redeemed from in the phrase that shows up in various documents over the years, sin, death, and the power of the devil. Um, yeah, it's it's actually pretty clear. But she says that the uh, the visitors also seek to redeem us, she says, quote, but they are able to tell us why and from what. Well, what is – what is the deal? Well, the deal is we were all, she says, demoted from this planet from more advanced planets within our island universe of 12 solar systems, this planet being the lowest in vibration and therefore civilization. But despite flunking us, in her words, the visitors have never abandoned humanity and they are trying to help humanity start the climb back up all over again. So – we have been separated from the goodness of the visitors through our own flaws here on this um, planet we've been demoted to, and they are trying to redeem us to bring us back up to a state of grace. Gosh, I I've heard some religions talk about that before. And if I sound snarky, it's because while Laura has a lot of really good qualities and, and things about her I really like – she also gives off the impression that, that she is just the smartest person in any room she's in. And anybody who disagrees with her is clearly just somebody who doesn't understand or is trying to undermine her in some way. Uh, and, and she gets a little, a, a little bit like that over, overall. And then when you, she sort of explains what she's talking about, you realize that in a lot of ways, it's the same sort of thing other contactees have been saying all along. She continues this idea, however, a little bit further. We literally did fall from paradise. The original people were brought down by spaceship, those following arriving through rebirth, reborn over and over on this planet, improving during some lifetimes, throwing away others, and slipping downward again. At first, the visitors openly gave their help to the ancients, but later they found it necessary to withdraw as Earthman became too diabolically clever and resented their help or became pious and began to worship the visitors as being gods, rather than trying to improve themselves. So how are the visitors actually going to help us overcome this? If they've left us alone because we were too clever for them, or we, we worshipped them, or we were diabolical, they've come back now, so what are they going to do for us? The purpose of the coming of the visitors is to help us to isolate or become aware of our human and soul minds, or negative and positive polarities, or thinking energies of our conscious minds, and the third, less active neutral polarity or father mind in and as part of our conscious mind, and to merge these before it is too late. As the tensions mount on this planet, and atmospheric vibrations increase, and even this aggravated by continuing atomic tests. This awareness and development we must accomplish before we can even begin to establish a more godlike society on this planet, let alone go and visit their planets. So in a sense, it's about our behavior and our actions, but really there's a lot of talk throughout this book about this positive and negative and neutral energy and the father mind and balancing all of these forces within us. And it's this balancing that will enable us to accomplish what we need to accomplish to become a peaceful, productive society as the, the space visitors would like us to be. Chapter two, I see the saucers gets into Laura Mundo's um, connections with George Adamski and the flying saucer scene. In 1953, she gets a copy of the book Flying Saucers Have Landed, begins networking with other flying saucer believers in the Detroit area, and is persuaded to be part of a group that is going to invite Adamski to Detroit to lecture, and she's the one who handles all the promotion and publicity for this. And this happens, the first visit to Detroit happens in March of 1954, and Laura reports that Adamski spoke to over 4,000 people at that time. And as the months go on, this flying saucer work becomes more and more important to her daily life. 
When my TV show went off the air the following September, I knew that I must devote my full time to the work with no remuneration except from those who wished to share the expenses of distributing the material. But this had some consequences. She says before long she lost her home, her car, jewelry, life insurance, her other worldly possessions. Um, She had to, you know, keep doing this work and keep doing other work. But if she's doing this for no remuneration, remuneration, um, she doesn't seem to put together that, you know, unlimited financial opportunity, right? You're supposed to be making money at the saucer thing, especially, well, maybe not making money at the saucer thing, but good grief. You shouldn't be losing your car and on the verge of losing your home or, or, whatever. Um, We'll see more evidence of this later, but she really did throw herself into this saucer thing headlong. She's writing to Wright-Patterson Airfield in Dayton because she'd heard rumors that they were investigating flying saucers uh, and that they told her that um, they were, uh, they were, they were, they were working on it. They were, had a serious UFO program going on, which we know now is, uh, is blue book. And there were other official agencies getting in touch with her as well. In April of 1958, an agency in Washington, D.C. wrote me saying they were aware of my saucer group activities and asking my opinions of such groups. They hoped that someone from that department would soon have the pleasure of speaking with you personally, which incidentally never developed. In the meantime, however, my reply would be kept entirely confidential, as it is not our policy to discredit anyone. Consequently, I consider that I have continued my saucer research with the knowledge, if not official approval, of the government. Because of this information here given, many human-minded saucer researchers may consider me to be a spy for the government, while if I had not contacted them, many would probably say I was against the government, neither of which, of course, is correct. See, Bill Moore wasn't the first of these people to be, you know, collaborating with the government or getting approval from the government for their uh, for their activities. But she she is. I think it's it's very um, very true what she says that if she, no matter what she did with regard to these government contacts that she supposedly had, she would be condemned either way by one group or another. Before long, she wasn't just promoting Adamski's lectures in Detroit. She was promoting lectures by Desmond Leslie, and they brought Donald Kehoe in and Edward Ruppelt of Project Blue Book and some other people that we have heard about on the show. Another man whom we now miss greatly was brought to Detroit to lecture. He was Dr. Morris K. Jessup, an astronomer and author of three published books on flying saucers. He came back many times to see us. On his last visit, however, we were sorry to recognize an icky feeling which had come into his aura or vibrations, evidence that energies of lesser vibration were pulling down his own, as it can when one is weary or inviting them in by concentrating upon them. He admitted that he had been experimenting in psychism as part of his saucer research and that he was an admirer of Apensky, the Russian mathematician mystic who did likewise only to report on them. Later, Dr. Jessup committed suicide. This is a prime example and one of the first examples in the book of – we get the impression very clearly that Mundo is not in support of any kind of psychic connection or psychic communication with the visitors. She she constantly condemns this. It's a bad thing. It leads to bad things and you cannot trust what people who say they have a psychic connection to these groups have. She is – pretty stringent on that uh, on that point. There are other people who came to Detroit to lecture that she uh, promoted as well who were not nearly as icky as Morris K. Jessup became. Buck Nelson, a Missouri farmer, was one of our most interesting lecturers in 1956. Flying saucers had come down on his farm and Buck had spent a great deal of time with the visitors. In fact, he claimed they even took him and his dog on a saucer ride to the moon, Mars, and Venus. On their return trip, they brought a dog with them from Venus. Later, Buck began to try to contact the visitors by radio, against which they have warned us. I have myself received radio messages from the visitors, into which I will go later. Mental contact began to develop in his mind, and his research took a turn toward the mystical and became, in my mind, questionable. 
The last reports had it that the government had contacted him and was setting aside a certain amount of money for research into a group that Buck might gather around him. It was said that the race with the Russians for the moon had grown so desperate that even the ideas of crackpots were being considered. Okay, so a number of things going on there. You remember Buck Nelson. We we did an episode on him and his space dog, Bo, back uh, several years ago, 2018 maybe but uh, what's interesting is is yes what's interesting is is the the talk that the government had started throwing money at buck nelson to put together a think tank to get us to the moon ahead of the russians that's that that might be the the single silliest thing i've encountered in a long time uh while working on this program but the other thing i thought was interesting here is she's she says you know radio contact with the aliens you know the aliens have told us do not do that next sentence she says i mean i've done it which i'll tell you about later so it, again there's there's she's the, she's smarter than everybody else and things that other people aren't supposed to do it's okay if she does them. Uh, this, this becomes kind of a uh, kind of a recurring thing. So, in addition to to running these uh, these these shows, these these lectures, uh, Laura Mundo and her associates have also had their own uh, their own experiences. And one sighting she had, which was really interesting, took place in the summer of 1954 in Port Huron, Michigan. On the afternoon of Sunday, September 7th, 1954, the individuals who have signed their names below saw the following unidentified flying object. It was a cloudless blue sky, a slight wind blowing from the north. Suddenly, into this cloudless sky came a huge cloud, definitely cigar shape and contour, the size of a city block and about two or three building stories high. It was traveling rapidly into the wind, about 300 feet above the treetops. It came from our left as we were sitting in the backyard in the sunshine and stopped just in front of us, not a half mile away, as though it had put on brakes. Outside of its rapid travel and sudden stopping, our eyes were drawn to the obvious rapid disintegration of the cloud-like vapor. As we watched, within half a minute, two saucers suddenly dropped out of the front of the vapor-like cloud, which incidentally still maintained its outline of a cigar shape. The saucers were cylindrical, silver, and a little larger than an automobile. They dropped directly down, a hundred feet or so, one after the other as though playing tag, and then shot right back up and then down and several times as though they were chasing each other. Their motion was too rapid to allow for distinguishing of detail. After a minute or a minute and a half's activity, they shot down over the treetops and disappeared. The cloud, however, still keeping its original outline, had been disintegrating still as rapidly all this time, and by the time the saucers disappeared, it had completely disintegrated too. Then suddenly, a spurt of vapor shot back out again, and it too then disintegrated. All this happened within two minutes' time, and could be seen with the naked eye. Wow. I mean, that that one, that sounds cool. At first, when I was reading it, I was thinking, oh my gosh, are they going to say this cloud of vapor is the UFO? Because I remember reading in some UFO magazines, which may or may not have been the actual UFO magazine back in the day. I remember seeing lots and lots of pictures of what were clearly just clouds labeled as motherships. So I was I was really excited in this report when actual sort of saucers came out. There was another sighting or an, or an encounter rather that took place also in 1954, this one in November of 1954 in the Detroit area and it is outstanding. I, Lawrence Cardenas, on the morning of September 30th, 1954, about 5:30 a.m., was on my way to work as steward of the Dearborn Inn, traveling west on Rotunda Road, Dearborn, Michigan. I had passed the traffic light at Greenfield Road and saw that the light at Southfield Road ahead had just changed to red. I slowed down and paced myself at 30 miles an hour in order not to have to stop at Southfield. I state this to show that I was not traveling too fast. About one-third of a mile from the Southfield intersection, my eye was suddenly drawn to a large vacant field to a mass of brilliant color. The color was coming from an object that I would call a flying saucer, about ten feet high, tapering down to the edges. Portholes were visible. Dawn was just breaking and my car lights picked up almost at the same time near the road a group of about 15 little men between 4 and 5 feet high standing together grouped around a taller man in a brown uniform trimmed with gold. 
The little men were clad in greenish-gray uniforms, had tight-fitting skull caps with pointed beaks on their front, and antenna. They had on goggles and breathing apparatus, and I could not see their faces, but their hands were moving as ours do when we were gesturing while talking. Some of them turned to watch me as I passed, but there was nothing hostile in their manner. I was past the scene before I realized that what I had seen was a flying saucer and its occupants. I hesitated about going back, only because I was late to work and would have had some difficulty explaining why I was further held up. I had no feeling of fear. The men themselves seemed to be on a friendly investigation since the saucer had landed near an area where a road was being built and near a derrick crane and other apparatus. My big question with this encounter is the antenna. Now, are the antenna attached to the helmets or are the antenna part of their heads and there was like a sort of antenna-shaped protrusion from the helmet to protect their natural antenna? Uh, and yeah, I, I don't know. That's, that's an interesting, an interesting question. Also, I haven't looked at a map, but I would love to pinpoint exactly where this happened and go down there. Although I, I halfway suspect that interstates might have changed a lot of this since 1954. Okay, this is a good point at which to take our usual break. And when we come back, we will see some of Laura Mundo's conflicts with others in the flying saucer scene back in the 1950s. If you like The Saucer Life and want more and want to support us, you can do so in exchange for bonus content, early episodes, and all kinds of weird stuff. Um, patrons get the episodes before everybody else by at least a few days, and there's a few chunks of bonus content every month. Uh, this month in March, as if you're listening live, we are going to be uh, watching the, uh, the, the classic mid-80s movie Euphoria with the late Cindy Williams. That's going to be fun. Um, there's uh, there's a bonus episode that I, I think is actually going to be more Laura Mundo. I, I'm on a real Laura Mundo kick these days. So you can check that out at patreon.com slash chizomedia or through the link in the show notes. You can also check out past episodes at saucerlife.com or inside your favorite podcast app. And as always, we're on Twitter and Instagram at saucerlife. You can email us at thesaucerlife at gmail.com or contact us by post at Chizo Media, P.O. Box 68, Grand Blank, Michigan, 48480. And we had some feedback to our last episode uh, about UFO Magazine, that first issue of, sorry, sorry, California UFO Magazine. Uh, Matthew says, great episode as usual. Zine scenes are always a favorite of mine. In the mid 90s, I worked in one of the last remaining newsstands in my part of upstate New York. I don't recall a lot of shelf space for UFOs or paranormal activity. Any space not occupied by respectable magazines was reserved was reserved for more, shall we say, 976 <laughs> content. Lastly, I was disappointed Dr. Winifred Cutler hadn't placed an ad in the inaugural issue. 1986 was right around the time she started hawking pheromones, and I feel like an opportunity was missed, if I'm honest. Yes, I remember um, in high school in various magazines seeing Dr. Winifred Cutler uh, um, you know, sort of selling these sort of pheromones to attract, uh, to attract, I think, was it just the opposite sex? Didn't matter what you were looking for in someone, it would just attract the opposite of whatever you were, which leaves out a chunk of the population, honestly. But, um, yeah, it, it's a, um, those ads were, those ads were great. Uh, over on the Patreon, Laura said she, uh, she can't get over the therapist for aliens adjusting to earth. This zine was everything, almost everything I love about UFO lore. And uh, also on the Patreon, uh, Caleb echoes my feelings about books being long. Long books are, are long. He says, in order to avoid reading books, I'll listen to a banal interview. I've recently gone back and listened to his interviews from 2005. And boy, talk about some things change and most stay the same. Yes. Um, banal of America, a uh, friend of the show, Tim Banal's groundbreaking UFO podcast. Uh, he, he, Banal talked to just about everybody who was worth talking to right from the very beginning and uh, and continues to as well. Always keep your eye on Tim Banal. All right. Um, another person to keep your eye on is Laura Mundo. 
So let's get back to her. So into chapter three, a winnowing out. This is an interesting chapter because we start to get a little deeper into some of Mundo's conflicts and and points of contention with other saucer folks. And we also get more of her own experiences. And she starts off this chapter by talking about how in March of 1957, they were going to do a big Detroit saucer convention that their organization was going to host and would be joined by other Detroit groups that had broken off from theirs. Uh, The reasons for breaking off were were interesting. She said some had become very, in in quotes, objective in their saucer research, which – and she said later they died out of boredom. And then other groups had – had tended toward the the psychism, the psychic connection. So she positions herself sort of in the middle of the spectrum between the the overly um, objective, maybe skeptical folks on one end and the people receiving psychic transmissions on the other. But at this uh, at this convention, somebody showed up who was very interesting. A young man who came to the delegation meeting showed me as they can that he was a visitor. Later, about two in the morning, I recognized his voice, although he was trying to disguise it, when he called me on the phone, anonymously identifying himself as representing the silence group, which had, at the time, been reported as going about silencing saucer researchers. He told me that I had better get out of flying saucer research at once because I had come too close to the truth. My soul mind told me at once he was a visitor through whom the father must discover now who can be frightened out of saucer research. I think this might be the most unique explanation for a man in black or silence group encounter that I've ever heard. They weren't really telling me to get out of saucer research. They were testing me to see if I could be frightened into getting out of saucer research, basically testing my loyalty to spreading the good news of the Space Brothers. That's that's actually pretty interesting. Also interesting is the fact that before she had even knew about UFOs or gotten into the saucer research area, Laura had an encounter, well, it, uh, an experience. I think that's probably the better way to put it. An experience that began to open her mind up to possibilities she was not expecting. About a month before the saucer field opened up to me, I was weeping one day while going about the house, doing my housework. I was concerned with difficulties in my own personal life that seemed to make no sense, and about having to take steps within it I did not want to take. Suddenly I heard my own voice, only more beautiful than my real voice, my soul self, speak crossly with me, telling me to be patient. Then beautiful music and a chorus of indescribable male and female voices singing Jesus, lover of my soul, welled in behind and up over my head. Then silent understanding came, as though climbing a spiraling frequency up over my head. My conscious mind had been able to contact the even higher balanced father frequency of my own mind, not some great master or spirit being or visitors. Many saucer researchers, having such an experience, would probably, in error, believe they were contacting either or both. This can happen after an individual has meditated too much, precipitating too many positive energies, refining the physical body to where it no longer is proper insulation, and where the soul mind cannot stand the atmospheric pressures. The Roman Church, knowing of this mental development, has adopted it by symbology in marrying their nuns to the Church. Just an aside, I have to acknowledge that that was not a chorus of male and female voices singing Jesus, Lover of My Soul, uh, because I like this version better. This was um, Maddie Pryor and the Carnival Band from their album of the works of Charles Wesley, which I didn't know was a thing that uh, 70s folk rock people did in their later years, but um, I, I approve. So 
she's having these sort of encounters or experiences before she gets into saucer research. And very quickly after she encounters um, the field of the saucers, reads Adamski's book, gets involved with these people, the visitors visit her in person. A month after I got into saucer research, February 1954, while promoting Adamski's lecture, the visitors came over my home in their saucers and sent a beam of neutronic energy of the father frequency to my brain, reactivating brain cells that had been put to sleep, so to speak, when I also had been demoted from a more advanced planet. So the way I interpreted this is that when the visitors come to see her, they're, they're putting right things that, that changed when she was demoted, which means reborn into her particular body and soul on earth here, reactivating those brain cells, as she says. So is this why she has insight that other people don't with regards to saucer things? Is this why she knows not to take the psychic research seriously, that it's dangerous? Is this why she has a greater understanding? Because she had this adjustment done? That's the impression I get. But to be clear, there's much in this book that isn't very clear. It is sometimes confusingly written. Um, Recording some of the passages from it, I found myself unable to really easily parse the sentences as I was reading them. It's a, uh, it's a strange book and it could have used perhaps a little more editing, but we'll get to its creation in a bit. So another thing that strikes me is that basically she had a psychic UFO flying saucer visitor father, however you want to say it experience, but she constantly warns against that. And, and she says that, that she, um, she, she, doesn't have a problem with Adamski saying, don't listen to the psychics as many of the, uh, the psychic UFO people did. Um, she draws a distinction between what she experienced with her frequencies being adjusted and people getting these supposed, uh, supposed messages. See, she believed that what she experienced was more akin to, um, to Paul on the, uh, the road to Damascus. Next, Mundo gets into some more of the conflicts that she had with various saucer people and casts them in a, uh, an interesting sort of light. By the third time Adamski came back to Detroit later in 1955, I heard him attempting to turn my co-worker against me, or rather the father through him, of course, and stating that I was not as capable as they were. Others who had proved themselves to me to be visitors were likewise talking against me. I began to suspect some kind of plot underfoot as I watched the others innocently allowing themselves to be appealed to and flattered. This gossip and backstabbing and behind-the-back talk, she acknowledges as uh, her bad feelings about it initially were because she had always been taught it was wrong to talk about others behind their backs. But really, she said, this was a way for the father to uh, let her know who was against her and basically who could be trusted. It's part of this winnowing out process that she titled the chapter after. There were other things that were part of this winnowing out process as well that enabled her to see who was fully on her wavelength and who wasn't. I found my morals questioned also as I reported on the universal marriage practiced on other planets where no vows to each other or legal forms have ever been necessary. On other planets, I explained, they find such a social ceremony unnecessary when two people are to be truly united, nor do they find any legal contract which binds mismated people advisable when the idea of true marriage makes both unnecessary. Thus, again, my ideas and statements were grossly misunderstood and misrepresented. I can see why some people in in the 1950s might find her idea a little bit outrageous, but it doesn't strike me as being outrageous from her perspective as a woman who had gone through a divorce in 1950 when those procedures were much less um, – much less fair and equitable than uh, than than they are now, and not to get too psychoanalyze or uh, psychoanalyze that's that's not a word, but uh, you know what I mean. Um, I, I kind of wonder to what degree 
her ideas about universal marriage are a reflection of her own perhaps uh, desire for a system like that that might have saved her a lot of uh, a lot of grief in her own life. And there are some other complaints about her that are a bit more material in nature. Next, I was accused of making a living off my saucer work. Later, my mental balance was questioned as well. I could tell at once when somebody who doubted me came to me from his vibrations. I could tell this from my sensitivity to his vibrations. Many doubted, withdrew. Some came back and withdrew again as I allowed it without question, knowing, however, the time would come when the father would have to close the circle. I don't get the idea from everything I've ever read about her or by her that Laura was in this for monetary gain. It's hard to make a living selling mimeographed stapled saucer books. It it really doesn't it, it doesn't pay off. But th- this passage also sort of gives this impression, you know, this, there's this winnowing out and it's this is a way these they're questioning my integrity, they're questioning my mental state, but this is all just to show me who I can trust and who I can't and who is really on on my side. And now we're getting towards the end of the interesting part of the book. And I've got to be honest, there's there's a lot in this section that is a lot of fun. This uh, this chapter is called My Meeting with Orthon and then she and subsequent chapters she gets into Lucifer and Satan and things like that. And then it gets into the sort of heavy metaphysical stuff that is is not very interesting. If you, if you found George Adamski's Cosmic Philosophy interesting, you might find this interesting. I do not. And um, it, I, I found it really, really bogs things down. So I, I think we're going we're gonna to finish up with this meeting Orthon. And Orthon's <laughs> – I can't believe I'm – I can't believe this is a real sentence I'm saying. Orthon's life in suburban Detroit in the 1950s. It is, it is outstanding. So Orthon had – openly introduced himself to Adamski in the desert back in 1952, right? Sort of the the sort of mind communication and things like that. Mundo points out that, that in general, the Space Brothers cannot openly introduce themselves because um, part of humanity's learning and conditioning process is, is to seek out the Space Brothers and to recognize them when they are in disguise. And when she first came across um, Orthon – his, um, his, she says his, his earthly appearance that she saw would have, quote, almost completely belied his true identity. He had his thick blonde hair cut in the square-necked fashion of a juvenile exhibitionist. It was draped in the back or brushed into the pattern of what I could best describe as that of a duck's posterior, where its wingtips touch. His big blue eyes, however, were as innocent as a baby's, but most people would never get past the haircut to notice them. The haircut, I suppose, was Orthon's most effective disguise. His brown suit, of a very unusual material that seemed to have a living quality about it, was cut, however, in the zoot suit style of the day. He wore shoes with what we call built-up heels, certain to raise the eyebrows. He sat with an empty bottle of beer in front of him all afternoon with an unlighted cigarette in his hand. There's a lot to unpack here. Let's start off with the fact that the terminology is is very strange. Um, like hair, like a teenage or juvenile exhibitionist. I, I don't think she means exhibitionist in the sense that I would use the word exhibitionist. I think she probably means something more like show off, like a, a, a juvenile show off. And the, the hairstyle, like a a duck's posterior. Um, with where its wingtips touch. You mean a ducktail haircut? Is, is that what we're talking about because I think that's probably what you're talking about. Also, the suit, uh, the zoot suit style of the day. Which day? Um, I'm not sure. Were zoot suits a thing in the 50s? I I didn't think they were. Um, They might have been in Detroit. I'm not going to try to track down Detroit zoot suit revivals of the Cold War uh, right now, but that struck me as kind of odd, but there's, there's also this, this sense that, oh, the high heeled shoes, the, the built up heels and the shoes that, that attracted, that attracted looks. Um, 
it sounds like Orthon is kind of a, a, a weirdo hipster, just kind of hanging out with his empty bottle of beer and his, his unlit cigarette. So Laura recognized Orthon because her, um, her soul mind recognized him. And even before they spoke to each other at this, at this meeting, they had an unspoken connection. They caught each other's eye and nodded to each other at various points during this, uh, during this meeting that he appeared at. And at one point he was standing next to her, nodding toward a girl that she, that she realized was the woman who quote, would be taking my place when I left the planet sometime in the future. I, I like her successor. It's a very strange way to say that, but the big question is, she's at a meeting, George Adamski is there, other saucer people are there, and she's saying Orthon is at the meeting. Did anybody else see Orthon at this thing? The next day, Adamski told my co-workers that Orthon had been at the convention, but was surprised when they told him that I had recognized and had already informed them of the fact. Adamski, however, has never publicly admitted that Orthon was at the convention. Later, when asking Orthon if he had met me, according to Adamski's later publications, he denied that he had met me personally. In other words, Adamski was given the kind of answer that he unconsciously, perhaps, wanted to hear, and especially if he had not yet learned to release any developments to the father, who knows what everybody has done as a part of his plan. I would have loved to have been there when Adamski was was telling the other sorcerers that Orthon was here at our meeting yesterday. And they just sort of looked back and was like, yeah, we, we know. Laura Laura told us she saw him. That would have been a wonderful moment. But we also get or, um, Adamski kind of throwing uh, throwing Laura under the bus here as far as her meeting with Orthon goes. It, later publications saying, no, no, Orthon, Orthon didn't show up. I asked Orthon and, uh, and he said he wasn't there. That's a bit, a bit shady. Laura says that this incident um, – sort of convinced her that that this is this is the very kind way she says it that quote adamski was not always hitting the father frequency in his mind although the father surely spoke through him at times very very clearly saying adamski was not infallible and he could misinterpret the messages that he was given orthon would hang out in detroit he enjoyed being with the people in the uh, the saucer group that Laura ran, but he had to take steps in order to disguise himself from the humans. Orthon continued to be interested in our group as well as other local groups. In order to hide his beautiful translucent skin, however, he had disguised himself as a woman in order to wear a makeup base on his face. If he were recognized, his mission of being a moderator sent by the father would be nullified. We would be too excited, or rather, would be our atoms that are us to receive the energies in a balanced fashion. A more gradual approach, often including denying the truth, had to be used. Visitors sometimes take the negative roles in arguments that they often start themselves. Orthon smoked her cigarette and took a social drink as well, even claimed to receive mental messages from her boyfriend in outer space. This struck me as very odd because if Orthon was able to be the guy with the ducktail and the platform shoes and the zoot suit with the the beer bottle and cigarette at the saucer meeting why why wasn't he dressed as a woman then to hide his beautiful translucent skin it it doesn't make sense <laughs> it i mean yes i know it, it's a contacty story these things generally do not make any sense, but this seems like something that needed to be explained a little bit. But eventually, you know, he's he's hanging out there, dressed as a woman, doing saucer stuff, and eventually Laura realized that the time had come to reveal locally to the people on her mailing list the name that uh, that Orthon had taken, basically to out whoever was Orthon and explain this to him. But she said that others had already recognized this person as uh, as Orthon. Um, her co-founder, Connie, uh, co-founder of the Planetary Center, Carmela Falzone, um, 
John Markser, her one of her sons, and uh, her friend Jim Wales, um, who she often worked with. They um, they recognized who he was, but she said that immediately after, quote, many who had hesitated about totally denying me and my understanding now had their proof that I was wrong in recognizing Orthon as a visitor. They seized this situation in order to find some excuse for denying the validity of my work. So she reveals about, about Orthon and people use this against her. And they also tried to debunk her claims that this person was Orthon. Some had known the individual whom I was saying was Orthon for several years, since the beginning of the local saucer research, when she began attending lectures, proving nothing. Some went to Orthon's home where she lived with her grandmother, asking him point blank if he was Orthon, unaware he would have to deny it, especially if there were further missions the father had in mind for him while he posed as that particular personality. I have so many questions. Um, my biggest question is, I, I would like to know the name of this person who was Orthon. I think that would be interesting. I see what I could find out about them. But the, the bigger question in my mind is, was, was the person who she thought was Orthon, was he a man who was living as a woman? Was that part of it? Like, was that part of it? Um, if so, there's a whole lot going on sort of with subtexts of hidden personalities and, and, and dimensions and, and revealing that and people being uncomfortable with it. That's, that's fascinating. And there's, there's other elements of it that um, are also very interesting on an interpersonal basis, such as this. The individual who I've said was Orthon helped a well-known saucer researcher, unbeknownst to himself, rebalance his negative electrons with his overactive protons through meditation, whereby sex had become repellent to him. Later, the researcher made a normal adjustment and married. Orthon dated him, previous to his normal marriage, as a woman, but only to be in close proximity with the individual, not to be intimate. Laura goes on to explain that Orthon helped, get the word right, rebalance this person who was this man who was a homosexual instead of condemning him. So, so basically Orthon adjusted him so he could enjoy married life with his wife. It's very, very strange, but very 1963 also. Um, and, and more open, she says, and friendly is probably not the right word. Tolerant, uh, in a way, not tolerant as we might like tolerance to be demonstrated, but she was very clear that, that Orthon, you know, understood and, and adjusted him rather than condemning him. Um, but the, the dating while Orthon is, is living as a woman with this man who needs to be adjusted to enjoy married life with his wife, but it's not dating to be intimate. It's just to be in his presence. I, part of me wonders if, there was some kind of of epic soap opera level interpersonal stuff going on in this flying saucer club scene and this story is is sort of the way that Laura sort of processes it or presents it because it's it's very it's very strange but while i would like to hear more about that story and about some of these personalities involved um, Laura does make it clear that that Orthon is going to spill the beans at some point. There will come a time when Enoch Orthon will have to back me up publicly, but first privately, beyond my small group of co-workers who knew he has never denied anything to my face. God backed him up by approving publicly of his efforts to help humanity before taking him to Venus by spaceship. Oh, just a little footnote. In another section, she claims that Orthon is is Enoch from the Hebrew Bible. So there you go. In later chapters of the book, Laura goes into her theories about Lucifer and that um, a current figure we've talked about in this episode is actually the present day incarnation of Lucifer, but he's been the incarnation of a lot of people over the years. At least I think that's how it goes. George Adamski has never denied my statement that I understand him to have been Lucifer, of the sun, reawakened at the lesser frequency of being as Adam, reborn as Noah, Moses, David, Elijah, improving and rising in vibration each lifetime. Going to Venus alive in a fiery chariot as Elijah, reborn back here from Venus as Jesus, 
neutronized and going by spaceship to the sun, alive. Reborn back here as Adamski for this final time around, as our examination test, not his, to be neutronized once again and to leave by spaceship for a rest, to be reborn back here as a little girl in order not to perpetuate his imbalanced thinking any further, his having been male in most of his lifetimes and not having been born a child, maturing and doing so, neutronized to the sexless stage and leaving for good, having helped those whom he allowed to follow him into demotion to this planet back to the stage of graduating again. Now, I know in these circles, Lucifer is a, a figure of, of free will um, as opposed to like pre, predestination and, and sort of things like that. But given the somewhat tendentious relationship between Laura and Adamski, um, saying, oh yeah, he, he used to be Lucifer and he's never denied it. And I even gave him my whole mailing list so he could deny it to everybody. It's kind of interesting. And um, I kind of wonder what their relationship was like. There are some other things that um, where she's talked about how you know, he was, he hated women. He was very prejudiced against women, talked bad about women a lot, was kind of a gropey womanizer at various points. Um, it's interesting to see somebody sort of fall away from Adamski, but not so much that they have to reevaluate the things that they are saying themselves. Another interesting thing that Laura talks about is the reincarnation between um, between different lives as, as you go through these different lives and how you will be born as a man or and then born as a woman and you can alternate these things. And she relates this to some things that go on in society. We often see men who would like to live as women and the opposite. And these individuals are often scorned, especially when they demonstrate these desires. They are only yearning for a chance to grow and to experience these reincarnations. I think this is a very interesting and kind of maybe compassionate within her own sphere of thinking about things as a way to sort of understand uh, people who want to live as a different gender. And, and again, this is published in 1963. This is, this is, um, this is not usual stuff for the time, but between this idea and the Orthon story about him having to live as a woman, I wonder who there was in Laura's life who might have been going through some of these, uh, some of these issues or feelings. Um, because I mean, I deep down, I don't think space brother Orthon was in Metro Detroit living as a woman. Um, but I think something was going on and she's sort of dealing with it through framing things in this contacty sort of way. One final thing, the last mundo idea we're going to consider is her method or theory of how to determine if somebody is the reborn soul of somebody you know who has died. The FBI cooperated with me in studying this matter, a project you as an individual could also take upon yourself if one of your relatives was killed while in the armed service. You should take the fingerprints of any child in the family who you have felt could be this dead individual in reborn state, simply use an ink pad, and send to the branch of service he was in with his identity and ask them to forward it to the FBI in Washington to obtain a comparison. It must be done this way. The FBI will cooperate, but they must have the request from the armed service before they will be able to do so. In my own instance, however, the FBI was unable to locate any matching print, the father not yet ready for the idea to be sprung on the public. I am to continue this idea as a preliminary effort, however, so that when the proof does come through, others will be informed and can discuss it with those who ask questions. That seems a suitably bonkers idea to end on, that you can track people through their reincarnations via fingerprints. Maybe this is a common idea. I'm not up on a lot of past life stuff, but it seems pretty impossible. And I, I do appreciate that she acknowledged that when she tried it, the, the FBI <laughs> didn't come up with a match. So what can we say about Laura Mundo? Um, we may be revisiting her in the future. Um, 
I would love to track down some of her writings, some of her other writings. Uh, they, they, there's one uh, called Earth Girl from 1967, which she says shares intimate details about the flying saucer scene in Detroit. And I cannot find this. If anybody has a copy of Laura Mundo's Earth Girl, um, hit me up and we will um, – We'll, we'll try to work out something. Uh, it's in three libraries, according to WorldCat. Uh, the nearest one is, I think, uh, nearest one to me is Penn State, which is, gosh, probably like a seven-hour drive. Might be worth it. Might be worth it to uh, check that out. I might take a field trip out there. But, um, boy, I need to uh, ask around. But the problem is she published these books herself, um, and it was uh, difficult to – keep lots of copies in print when you are basically having them printed yourself. There's no supply. There's no warehouse. And it, it's, it's, it's difficult. So one of the things we do have um, as a result of um, some research that's been done at the Gray Barker Collection in West Virginia is some of the correspondence between Gray Barker and Laura Mundo as she was preparing the manuscript and um, and, and Gray was putting it together. She told Gray she did not want any copyright, anybody to own the copyright. She wanted it to be free to reproduce and she didn't want any royalties from it because material things were not important and she should focus on her saucer work. And, and Gray replied that um, he's not going to get into royalties at this time with her, but he strongly suggests that she takes the royalties to use them to support her saucer work. In the end, she was, um, she was not happy with uh, what Gray Barker did with the manuscript. She felt that um, there were some things that he left out at the end, some appendices that she wanted in there. From the correspondence, it's not entirely clear what those are. Um, one of them was a transcript of a George Damsky talk, I think. And, and Gray was apologetic but said, look, we, we had to keep this to 80 pages or else we could not make any money selling it. So it's interesting that there was some back and forth and we don't have a, a full picture of what else Gray might have changed. Laura is a fascinating person and a uh, somebody needs to write a biography of her um, because she's this single mom, middle-aged single, not quite middle-aged single mom uh, in, in 1950s Detroit, raising two teenage sons and running a, a pretty interesting saucer empire. And when you read about her, uh, she's usually mentioned as the promoter for Adamski's Detroit stuff. Um, there's not much about her out there. And it's fascinating that uh, she doesn't get more more play. I think if her books were published in a more durable format than the sort of paper-covered, uh, stapled sort of thing, um, it's hard to, hard to know much if you don't have the, the sources originally. And – she was in Detroit, not California, and California was the place you want to be, right? So that's Laura Mundo. I'm sure we will see more of her down the road. Thanks for listening. Remember to send in your questions and comments via the usual channels, and we'll be addressing those next time. Our associate producer is Simpson J. Hanover III, and The Saucer Life is a production of Chizo Media, LLC. Chizo Media, our heart is with the people. Till next time, keep watching the skies, because the skies are watching you. Mm -hmm.